untouchable for a long time. Not done quite as well with the Indy card. He's had a lot of different rides. There you see Villanook trying to get by Willie T. But he's going to catch on one of these days, and when he does, he's going to be as tough here as he has been in the Trans Am cars. Do, do you think, in, in the case of Willie T, that as his teammate Robbie Gordon comes past trying to get his way back up through the field again, that all of that time in Trans Am cars may have hindered him, may have taught him techniques and styles that he's having trouble shaking now that don't apply to the Indy cars? I totally agree with you, Paul, 100%. I think it's created bad habits for him, and I think he just stayed there a little bit too long. But I also know this, people, human beings are capable of changing. One of these days, he's going to catch on, he's going to get the right signal, and he's going to take off because he is one Whoa! of these Emerson locked him up totally as Fittipaldi. That's turn one. Misjudged the braking area in turn one and now is falling backwards as he's got to get it back up to speed. That was costly. There's also a continuing display of smoke at the back of the car. Yes, and that, that wasn't dust for a while. It was too much smoke. And there is Paul coming. Tracy behind him. Now remember, Tracy was running fourth behind Fittipaldi. And you see he's right on top of him now. There goes. And Fittipaldi's got more than a brake problem. He's got an engine problem. I wonder if he wasn't sliding in his own oil. He probably really was because he's definitely got smoke coming out. And Let's Emo. look at it again here, Bobby. Here comes Emmo into the braking zone. Yeah, and here he is. He's awfully late, he's too late on the brake, and no smoke right now, though. Now we've got a lot of smoke, a lot of smoke coming down. Front tire's locking up, and there's smoke in the rear. You can see smoke now, but he's not to the turn yet. So obviously he's broken something. Could be the rear end. There's more than one problem there, Jackaroot. Well, Paul, believe it or not, Paul Tracy, his teammate, radioed into the crew to let them know that the rear end of the car was literally on fire. So they are calling Emerson Fittipaldi in right now. Oh, no, he's not coming in. He stopped on the edge of the course. Black smoke poured out of the exhaust here. Fittipaldi's out of the car as they put the fire out. It, he was in no danger with it. You can see that dark gray smoke coming out of it. That's material burning, like carbon fiber, oil combination, but not steam from the engine. All right, let me ask you the question then, Bobby. We talking circuit roughness? Is that something to do with the rear suspension of the car? Well, I don't really think so. He could have had a transmission problem going. Most likely had brakes overheating. This track is really hard on brakes. So Emerson Fittipaldi is out of the fight. His teammate Alonzer Jr. continues to lead. And Paul Tracy now moves up to third place with the retirement of Fittipaldi. Back in the Buckeye State. The Grand Prix of Cleveland, presented by Goodyear. There's Adrian Fernandez, currently running in eighth place. As we watch Raul Boisel, who sits ahead of a battle, sixth, seventh, and eighth, which is Boisel, Guzelmin, and Fernandez. This is Raul's eighth race here in the Cleveland Burke Lakefront Airport. And there they are. The Hollywood car belongs to Mauricio Guzelmin. That's Fernandez just behind him. They've been having one heck of a hard race. Fernandez in the back in the last of that little pack right there in the green and the red car. Mexican driver from Mexico, and he's really catching on this year. Driving for Rick Dallas. Little Al seat that he left last year, at the end of last year, for Penske's ride this year. The butt car of Scott Goodyear is not in the fight. He actually is 21st, but he can provide camera coverage for us as we look ahead to the 88 car of Guzelmin. Guzelmin is driver that's really looked good all year. Ironically, he's a teammate to Michael Andretti, a team that really doesn't associate with each other yeah, I was very say, much. He is, but he isn't. But ironically, Paul, he's been the fastest of the two all year so far. Not a whole lot of information being shared between those teams then. Gary Gerald. Well, for Mauricio Guzelman, some encouraging news in the last couple of weeks. They have found extra money now, or revenue, that they can get into a test schedule. He was able to test just one day thus far this season. Now they've scheduled four more test days, two for oval track, two for road course. They think that's going to help them immensely as they try to become more competitive in this series. Well, it can't help but help. I know that, and in my opinion, that boy needs a lot of help. He's one of the brightest ones we've seen all year. He linked him with Robbie Gordon. And a few of those guys like that, you're looking at some really good drivers coming along. Guzelmin, of course, with a long background in Formula One, one of those men who's found his way now into IndyCar racing at the top. 71 laps now complete. 85 laps, the scheduled distance here, 201 miles. Bike broken off for the moment. There comes Fernandez, the lone driver for 
the Gallus team, which in the past has been a multi-car team with such greats as Danny Sullivan and Al Unser Jr. Danny Sullivan, by the way, is on the grounds here thinking about next year. One of the other drivers that constantly gets named for places like Newman Haas Racing. What do you think of that, Bobby? Well, I really personally don't think Danny is going to be back. I think in his mind he's kind of retired, but you and I have a little bet on it, so we'll see how that comes out next year. I think he'd like to be with Newman Haas, don't you? Well, that might that might motivate a well, guy a little bit. Newman yeah. Haas is a pretty good team. I was going to say, who wouldn't? Looking back for Stefan Johansson. That, of course, is not him. Stefan's just behind the 19 My Jack car. The red and the blue car, Stefan Johansson. One heck of a good driver. And really been grinding hard today. And another promising driver, Alessandro Zampedri, who's being just lined up now by Stefan Johansson. Zampedri on the right. Bright young talent, I think, from Brescia, Italy, where the Mille Emilia used to start from. Zampedri, who I talked to, Gary and I both did at some length, uh, the other day, uh, talked about uh, his background in Formula 3000 in Europe and how he's making the adjustment to the Indy cars. You see he's having a beautiful run against Johansson. Johansson, of course, driving for Tony Bettenhausen, based out of Indianapolis, Indiana. Al Max, the sponsor on the car. Just behind them, you get a glimpse from time to time as Nigel Mansell closes in. Johansson runs in fifth place. He's having a marvelous day. You see it. Nigel right up in the corner of the screen there as we look down from the Goodyear blimp. Johansson driving for car owner driver Tony Bettenhausen. Well, this gives you an idea. It is truly an airport. There's runway 24 right. They come off onto the taxiways. But you know, I gotta say again about San Pedro. Here's a car, and then the Johansson's making a bid. We'll see if this is a clean shot. Yep, he lets him go by. That's a nice clean thing, not for position. San Pedro's running uh, tenth. And it's not often that you see Dale Coyne's equipment running that far up front. Robbie Buell was their driver the early part of the season. He was usually mired down around 18th or 20th. So this is a real good day for Dale Coyne. Well, Dale Coyne, who used to be a driver, Sam, I, I think he kind of relates to the drivers pretty well. You know, one of the interesting things about the Burke Lakefront Airport is it being a FAA runway airport facility, Naturally, there are a lot of planes landing here, so there's a buildup of rubber on what is already a fairly abrasive concrete straightaway for the Indy cars. And the guys, the first couple of years, were so surprised where they'd come sliding out, and they'd hit that area where all the rubber had been laid down by the aircraft, and the car would just suddenly stick real good and launch ahead. So now they've made it part of the whole way that they race here at the Burke Lakefront Airport. So Al Unser Jr. is out in front now with 75 laps complete. He is dominating this race here. The waterfront front of Cleveland, Ohio. The view is down from the Goodyear Tire and Rubber Company blimp. They've dispatched the blimp spirit nearby Akron, Ohio, to provide aerial views of the 1994 Cleveland Grand Prix. There she is, floating overhead. Giving us some great coverage shots as well today. Yeah, you know, they didn't have to come very far to get to this race. Those guys really like that. You got our boat parked down there in the marina. Boy, look at this. There's some spectators on the side. Hi, Ari. Hi, Emerson. Emerson doesn't even know we're here. Well, there's two drivers that are sorry they're out of the race. Look at them. Well, you can just see them out there just grinding his teeth saying, wow, I wish I was still in there. I'm not even going to ask why they were out there, though. Jack in, in front of the toilet. Jack? Well, the problem on Mike Croft, he's come to rest in what we call the back 40 of the main, of the, of the racetrack. He's not going to be able to make it back in without a tow. The reason, the fuel pump let go on the race car. So it's an early exit for Mike Croft. Well, that's too bad. More Honda problems. Isn't that a shame? Yeah, but boy, when they get it going, get out of their way. There are three Honda engines that started the race. Now just one in the car of Parker Johnstone is still running. That one not in contention. And most of these Honda engines, incidentally, under different configurations. Mauricio Guzman now in a fight with Fernandez. Battle for seven. I started to say the Honda engines are different configurations. They have some of the engines, like in Ray Hall, they fire two pistons at once, like they do the Ford and the Ilmore engines. And the others are like normal passenger car engines. They're different configurations from Honda, so they can try to do their development at a faster pace. 
Bobby, it's interesting, the one that's still running is the older configuration Honda engine. The two newer ones had trouble. They've tried all sorts of stuff in the last couple of weeks. They've had four test days. They tried a new plenum. It didn't work out, but they are, they've got a fire lit underneath them over at Honda, and they're trying to be competitive now. So watching Guzelman and Fernandez. Fernandez sweeps to the inside, and he's got him. The favorite play to pass, right going into turn one. Fernandez often, grabs seven. Often the guys pass like that, and you would see the other guy come back again, somewhat like Emmo did when he came out of the pits. These are two Reynard cars. Reynard, of course, being the new chassis manufacturer, new to the series this year. And started off winning, of course, at Australia. So we thought maybe they were going to dominate all year, but they seem to... There's Michael stopping for some reason. Another In, Renard. Another he comes Renard. to a stop yeah. at the edge of the course. And the car safety team right there to get him clear of traffic. Look at the nose of the car. Yes, he's definitely got the right front. Looks like it's bent, too. The nose got bumped and the right front bent, so he probably ran into somebody else. The nose actually was damaged earlier, so there's been yet another incident. Here's Teo Fabi. Now look at this combination. Fabi, of course, had a brilliant start in IndyCar racing back in 1983 when he had the pole for so many races, won several races. Now the word is this might be his last e year in IndyCar racing. Apparently Jim Hall has tested a driver in secret, a young driver whose name has not been released yet, at Rattlesnake Raceway, Hall's private test track down in Texas. The idea is that Fabi may be on his way out. Now Fabi had a brilliant uh, fourth place at Detroit a few weeks ago. You see Al Unser Jr. coming by him with great ease there. I don't think there's any question. I don't think anyone even within the team questions Fabi's ability. It's the idea of getting some new blood and reconstituting the team. Dale Fabi runs in ninth place. In tenth place is Alessandro Zampedri and Robbie Gordon owing partially to driving and partially to attrition is moving up and Gordon now runs in 11th place. Michael Andretti, of course, retired if you look at the running order four laps ago, five laps ago now. 81 laps now complete. We're in the closing stages of this race. This man going to do it again. Boy, it sure looks that way. But one can't forget, when you have an onset like Fittipaldi had that took him out of the race, if I'm in one of those other cars, Bobby, i got to be thinking, have I got the same engineering problem? Well, they're evaluating that. I promise you, that's an advantage to having one, two, or three cars. There's a lot of disadvantages, of course, but that's one of the advantages. You have problems with one, you look at the other one. When little Al came in her pit stop, they're obviously looking really close at the car so they can tell whether to slow down, keep his pace, or speed up. Well, Penske domination has been the story of the season this year so far. But except for Al Unser Jr.'s performance today, the Penske team has not been dominant. Mansell has been very fast. Emerson Fittipaldi has had trouble. And unusually enough, Paul Tracy has not shown exceptional speed. He's third now. He's never been up front in this race. And it's only Al Unser Jr. that's really held the pace for Penske. And normally you'd say this is Tracy's track. One of the other things about running on an airport circuit, they will not let the IndyCar officials install the specialized computer antenna lines that sense the car's passage over the track. And so we don't have our usual EDS scoring here, back to the old manual scoring system. And so we're not able to bring you quite as many representations of the field as we would like to, but we are getting some great help from Russ Thompson 